Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I know it's been a while. Um, I was going to do a little bit of an update video, but I think we're just going to get right into this study that I put out, or that I'm putting out. And it kind of explains what I've been going through in the last few months. Uh, before we get in there, I was, I was walking uh, Declan and got to see a rainbow. It started sprinkling with the sun out, so you got to see the sparkles on the sprinkles. And then the clouds really came in, and it was, it was a lot colder this morning, and it started to hail a little bit as it was raining. So I, we barely made it back with a little bit of hail and rain. And so we got back here, so I'm a little heated. So I got my sweater here that I normally see me in. Uh, if I get cold enough, I'll pause the video or, you know, cut out the part where I'm putting on the sweater. So I might go from this to the sweater if it gets cold enough. It was cold this morning, so it takes time to heat up a house. Uh, just a couple updates. I had it. My brother uh, got me the stabilizing stick, so I will try to do some walking talks and do some like you know updates. And people seem to like talk shows more than Bible studies. I still like to put out Bible studies. I'm I'm gonna focus if if, if God willing. I got two studies I want to put out. One that we put here. I even I only am left. And another one is Are you heading for Tarsus or Nineveh? Okay, because two things that have been on my heart, and that I've been going through some depression in the last few months, and I haven't put out any videos, I haven't been responding, I want to take some time to apologize to the brethren that have emailed me, and um, I just haven't been talking to hardly anybody, and I just, this study, I just want, as we go through this study, I'm going to just explain a little of the depression I've been going through, and where I've been wrong. I should, I should have come out with a video just saying, hey, I need to take some time for them. Uh, to spend some time with the Lord, you know, um, I should have just left the brethren hanging. I just, when we get through this study, I hope the brethren understand and that I that I'm not the only one. <laughs> I even I only am left. I'm not the only one that's going through depression. Okay, and the solution is always to spend time with God, but the the uh, it's never a solution to just ignore the brethren. Okay, and I apologize for that. Uh, getting burnt out. Okay. And we'll explain as we do the study. But this stick's supposed to stabilize, so I used to do walk and talks. People love the walk and talks, and I had to stop doing the walk and talks because my hand starts to shake. Okay. And it starts shaking too bad that people are like, it's hard to wash, I get headaches because I can understand some people, the screen shakes, it gives me headaches. So this is supposed to be a stabilizer, and if it can keep it stabilized enough, I got a program on here that the shakiness, it'll cut out a, a few inches around the screen to keep it from shaking. It's a stabilizing, it's a part of the, um, when you're making the videos. I forgot, my brain kind of froze on. Um, right. Editing, when you're editing the videos. Like, uh, mostly all I edit is, is fade in, fade out, because I just want to keep it real. Um, not trying to put on a show or trying to make it like I'm a, like I'm a salesman trying to sell something. The other thing the Brother in Christ got me, was an 8 gig hard drive. So I can, I was shocked that the hard drive I have now, which is almost 2 gigs, uh, it's almost getting full because I've got it full of a lot of brothers videos, my videos, and we'll be talking about that too, okay? About people thinking that we need ministries online when I've got a hard drive that's almost 2 Terabytes, you might not know what that is, but anyway, it's tons of Bible study videos going off of everything. You have the Holy Spirit, you're born again, you have the Word of God. In these tough the last days when brethren are falling away and, and you have false converts out there, uh, you can spend a lot of time between you and the Lord, easy, and go out to the real world instead of the fake world. You know, you know we've talked about this, the fake online Christ, uh, Bible-believing Christianity. Um, but the real world, you can go out in the real world and gospel tract and try to witness and just do your best to live your life for Jesus Christ and you can stay in the Word and you can stay in good Bible studies without being online Okay, at this point. I'm just saying I'm getting ahead of myself but if it gets that hard you know because they're always talking about everyone's falling away or it's hard to find a good Bible and there were a lot of good Bible believing preachers in the past and there's a lot of good Bible studies, Bible videos, audio where it's just audio uh, uh, studies and you can collect them all, and you can have them, and you can go through them from time to time. But mainly, this hopefully, this is where you're spending most of your time is in this, and prayer. Prayer and the Word of God. Hiding it in your heart and living it. So let's get to this study, and I'll, like I said, I apologize. 
I, I, the studies we go through it, uh, I start feeling like uh, Elijah, because we're going to be talking about Elijah. If you know that statement, I, even I, only am left. That's what Elijah said. Okay? And he, he, he isolated himself. He was on the run. He was hiding from everybody. I only am left. Okay? Before we get into that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. might take a while to flip through the Bible too. When I'm doing my daily reading, I'm only in one spot. I'm not flipping all over the place. So I'm going to try to turn. There's going to be some verses because we're going to be going, going, going. Please pause the video. If you hear footsteps, I apologize. That's Declan. Pause the video, turn to the scriptures, and then unpause the video. Okay. But we're going to be moving, moving, moving. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I know some people don't... We, we, I had to do an expository study on this because there was brethren that were misusing this verse. Okay. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the ga our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Okay. People try to get, they get stuck on as, the word as. But we've already done a study on this, just briefly going over it. If you want to go watch the expository study on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, go for it. But what, what's going on here is you have people coming in saying either, like the hope, Jehovah's Witness, the catching away already happened. The day of Christ has already happened. You missed it. And people are getting so worried and fearful. I missed it. Or you've got people like the people that don't believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ where... The, it doesn't happen, and the church has to go into the time of Jacob's trouble when it doesn't. And people start getting fearful that we're going to miss it because they're telling us we're not going up. We're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's what this was is going on here. So when he says the day of Christ is at hand, he still believes. The Bible says you're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. Present tense. We're to look for it every day as if it could happen today. And there are brethren out there that have turned their back on it, and you can tell. Their ministries are falling apart. They are falling apart. They're becoming worldly. They were becoming very prideful. All the things that they struggled with and they've kept it in check because Jesus could come back today, it's gone out of control. They're falling away. Brethren are dropping like flies. Why? Because you're not living as if Jesus Christ could come back today. It's one of the depressions. I look out there and I'm trying to fight the good fight and I see brethren dropping left and right. Okay? I'm having to deal with false converts. You get online, you can't tell who's saved and who's not. You really can't. That's why I hate this false online uh, so-called Bible-believing Christianity. I don't, and I'm just going to say it out loud. I don't believe anybody should have a full-time ministry that's 100% online. There's no such thing. I used to believe it was okay. I don't anymore. Anyone who's 100% online, they're not, they're something, their heart's not right with God. They need to be out in the real world doing ministry for the Lord. They need to be out there at house churches, street witnessing. Okay. Fellowshipping, mentoring, like men in ministry, mentoring other men in ministry. Okay. Being full-time ministry, it's, it, it's not a good thing. There's nothing wrong with having videos like this online. As you don't remember, I never claimed to be full-time ministry. Okay, I'm not full-time ministry. I'm not taking money from the brethren. God has provided for me. Praise God. Okay, it's not a brag. It's I'm saying God's provided for me. And even if I had to, you know, even if I was in trouble, my pride, it's hard for me to ask for help. It really is. And I'd have God will have to help me drop my pride to ask for help. But there's men in, online, false wolves in sheep's clothing, and there's some brethren that I believe are saved, that are claiming YouTube is their full-time ministry or whatever video platform they're on, okay? It's not, okay? What they're doing is they're hiding from real full-time ministry, true accountability. We'll get into that. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just getting frustrated because I'm getting burnt out on this because I'm being hurt by professing Christians that, that, that I get to know and I realize, hey, they're fake and false. I'm being hurt by brethren that are saved. I believe they are saved and born again, and I'm seeing them fall away, and I'm being hurt by them. I'm working so hard, and I'm not seeing much fruit these day, in these last days. And yes, that reflects to me, and I start looking at myself saying, Lord, am I a failure? Am I a failure? I'm getting ahead of myself. Like I said, we're going to get into... Um, 
we're going to get into 1 Kings. Okay? I, even I only am left. And I just sometimes I feel like a failure. Okay? But the, as the day of Christ is at hand, verse 3, let's keep going. But like, I didn't mean to go on a little bit of a tangent, but I, people still attack me. It says as there. It says as there. Okay, the day of Christ is at hand. That's how we're supposed to live. Is it guaranteed to happen today? No. He's not saying it's guaranteed to happen today. No, he's saying as it is at hand. We are supposed to live as if the day of Christ is at hand. We're supposed to be looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. To be called up with them in the clouds, to be with them in the air. And there's a part that talks about all those that love His appearing. When you have someone that says, I don't believe in the eminent, we call it eminent, but the day of Christ is at hand. I don't believe the day of Christ is at hand. There is no eminent return of Jesus Christ. You're dealing with someone who doesn't love the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're putting it off. Why? Because things down here are getting in the way. And that's 100% truth. They'll try to use good words and fair speeches to explain it away. Oh, no, no, that's not it. That's not Yes, it is. There's things down here that's getting in the way of things up there, especially the catching away. you looking for it. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man's sin be revealed, the son of perdition who is opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Now I'm not going to get into this, like I said, go to the study, but the main part I'm pointing out there is the falling away. There's going to be a falling away, then we get caught up, then the man of sin gets revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Not and uh, first John talks, I think first or second John talks about and that Antichrist that shall come. I've had brethren attack me. He's never called an Antichrist. Well, you need to read first, second, and third John again. Okay? That Antichrist that shall come. It's talking about a specific Antichrist. It's talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition. But there's going to be a falling away, brother and sister Christ. Who's still standing and who has fallen? I've been wrong before online. That's why I don't like online. You can't tell if someone's truly saved and just struggling. You can't tell if someone's truly saved and they've been deceived. And sometimes you can tell the false converts. Those, when, when you get all around and you look at everything, there's times where you can actually say, okay, that person, and I don't believe that person is saved. But there's been times where I've been wrong. And I've, I, I know you err on the side of caution, and you try, when you see someone that's, I've, I've preached this, when you see someone that's struggling to the point where they're starting to justify sin and wickedness, that you remind them why they got saved. Why they get saved, who it is that saved them, and who it is they serve. There's nothing wrong with going back to the gospel for someone who's saved. But there's times where it's, it's just, it's hard to tell online because it's just words. You don't get to see the life the proof of true salvation is the changed life. It's action. It's the life that they're living. You don't get to see that online. Even with me behind the camera, you get to see a little bit of the life that I'm living, praise God, a lot more than, than people just making comments, but you still don't get to see all my life. Okay, I'm Because uh, someone's going to say, well, we're not God. Yeah, I understand you're not God, brothers and sisters, but you know, hopefully you understand what I'm saying. You know, Take it with a grain of salt. When you have face-to-face -face fellowship, a house church, and you're making house calls, and you're going around checking on the brethren like a man in ministry, you're checking on the brethren, making sure they're okay, how's, how's your walk with the Lord on a weekly basis, <clears throat> sorry, you get to actually see the life that they're living. You can see, hey, you start backtracking, oh, I saw that you're falling, another brother and sister Christ saw you doing this, and... And I know you gave it up for the Lord, but it looks like you're starting to resurrect the old man. I see that you're having some hard times. Can we help? You know, that thing. Well, like someone who has a hard time asking for help, what if um, someone sees me and he offers some help? He sees you going through some hard times and they offer their help. Right? You don't get that online. So one of the things I think that's creating a lot of depression among the body of Christ is there's a lot of fighting going on among the body of Christ because you have wolves in sheep's clothing coming in pretending to be one of us 
and they're stirring the pot. You've got brethren that are falling away and you don't quite realize it until it's sometimes till it's too late. You've already been hurt, stabbed in the back, or the damage has been done. And they're, they're stirring the pot. And they're causing problems. Right? So we're sitting here and it's like, you know, am I the only one, Lord? Now, real quick, I know I'm not the only one, brothers and Christ. I know. This goes back to a whole nother study of the difference between knowing and believing. I know I'm not the only one left standing. Please, it's not a pride thing. I'm the only one left standing. How many of you brothers in Christ out there sit there and go, Lord, am I the only one that's doing this? Am I the only one starting my day with prayer? Some, I, I know I'm not. I've heard from brethren, and they say they are, but we sit here and go, Lord, am I the only one? Am I the only one starting my day with the Word of God in prayer and ending my day with the Word of God? Am I the only one struggling hardcore with the flesh, with the world, nowadays with brethren? Am I the only one that's really, the, my heart's in the right place because I want to stand for this book and I want to live for it and I want to live for you and I want to be a servant to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I the only one? Up here, I know I'm not, but there are days down here you start to believe you are. Now, remember what they say when it comes to salvation. You can miss heaven by 13 inches. I think it's 13 inches. You know you have the knowledge. What we call fake faith, where the Bible says faith unfeigned. In other words, faith that isn't fake. What's fake faith? You have the knowledge. But you don't really believe. You can know something and start to believe something else. These two can go against each other. I know I'm not the only one, but I start to feel like I am. I start to believe that I am. And what happens when that happens, God puts us in our place, as we're going to read here. Turn to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. God puts us in our place. First Kings 19. You might hear the rooster going crazy. I didn't let him out because it was raining and hailing a little bit. <laughs> so I didn't let him out. First Kings 19, we're going to start at verse 1 to get into context. And, Hah and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with, with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now if you read chapter 18... I think it is. You have the whole story of Elijah, the priests of Baal. They do the test. You know, fire comes down. Whoever's offering gets burnt up. That's the God that the Jews that are all watching because Jews require a sign. And you read that whole thing. The Baals all throughout the day are chanting, cutting themselves, doing all kinds of perverting their bodies, try, trying to worship their false God. And fire won't come down. And then you have Elijah. He puts tons of water over the the sacrifice. He puts it in the trough. It's just soaking with water. And then fire comes down from heaven and laps up all the water. So he takes the priest of Baal. He, orders, he tells the people to take the priest of Baal down to the river and they slay him right then and there. And that's where we are here. Ahab all right, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods... Do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one that, of them by tomorrow about this time. He's, he's threatening his life, and he's threatening his life by the lowercase g gods. That's important. Why? Verse 3, And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servants there. Brothers, just Christ, do we trust God? Today, I, another thing that's causing some uh, depression in my life is I'm looking out there and I'm seeing that even I seem to be falling into it where it says, I'm like, Lord, do I actually, am I starting to fear the lowercase g gods of this world? The way of this world? Over you? Elijah just got up left in fear. He did. God told him to do something. If God told him to do something, God can protect him. Uh, the three in the fire, I get them wrong, uh, in da the book of Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, uh, I, I get them wrong, but the three Jews that got thrown in the fire, they told the king, Nebuchadnezzar, 
that if God save us, great. If not, we're still going to obey the Lord. That's courage. Him getting scared and taking off and running, uh, that's, he, he started to give in to fear of Jezebel and the lowercase g gods. And we're going to keep reading. We're going to find out what he was afraid of. Okay. When they told her what he was afraid of, specifically. But brothers of Christ, are we trusting God? A lot of people are getting, a lot of ministries are turning into talk shows. You're getting distracted by what's going on in the world. And people, the more you, there's nothing wrong with, you know, like I said, spending 30 minutes on, you know, world news and stuff, what's going on in the world. But you need to spend primarily your life on the Lord, His Word, prayer, living the life of Christ, being a, a, a witness, okay? A living witness with how you live your life, not just a verbal witness, to, I'm pointing out the window here, to the world, but being a light for Jesus Christ. That's what you need to focus on. But a lot of brethren are starting to focus on the world with false so-called Christian news ministries are getting so distracted by the world. And what does that do? That gets you to start to fear the world. There's some brethren that are holding strong, they still trust God, but there's a lot of brethren that are starting to get fearful. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but they're starting to fear the world over fearing God. They start losing that trust and that faith in God that He knows what He's doing. God knew what He was doing. Let's keep going. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough now. Ah, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. Talk about depression. Okay. There's two things here. There's times in my life as a saved sinner where I've said, Lord, take my life. Can I come home? There are brethren, there's two parts to this too. I'm not trying to get too difficult, but there's two types of people that are looking for that catching away today, that are looking for it. There are people that are looking for it because they're, they, they love the appearing of our Lord and Savior, and they're very vexed by what's going on down here and the hardship down here. They're sick and tired of the wicked body of flesh. They're sick and tired of how wicked this world is. They're sick and tired of not, you know, you're not seeing people get saved as much anymore. And, and you're going through depression. And you're saying, Lord, just take me home, either in life or in death. Take me home, Lord. Then you have people that are making a huge mess of their life. They won't do what's right. They might not even be truly saved, might not be believing in this book. They're just making a huge mess of their life, and they think that the catching away is an escape from, from having to owe up to responsibility for your actions and your choices and your decisions down here. I remember Peter Ruckman once put out a video where Peter Ruckman, where he was kind of saying the same thing. The catch away will solve everything, even all of the problems you got yourself into. Uh, no, it won't. No, it won't. Has he forgotten the judgment seat of Christ? If you don't get it taken care of down here, you're going to have to face God up there with it. I'd rather get it taken care of down here than face God up there with it, at the judgment seat of Christ. All our works, whether they be good or bad, will be burnt up, and we have to face our Lord and Savior face to face. Well, I say face to face, but my face, our face on the ground, like John was in Revelation. He fell to the ground as if he were dead. And then you'll have to answer for it. I can either try to repent, forsake, get my heart right with God and ask God to forgive me here and now, or I'm going to have to do it at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? But you have those people that think, well, I can just continue making a mess of my life, living like the world, looking like the world, mostly false converts, and they try to use that as an excuse to get out of not having to live for the Lord today, not having to live for Him down here. They've made a huge mess of their lives. That's the wrong reason for looking for that blessed hope. Okay? That's just the wrong reason. The second thing for this part here, notice what he did here. He asked the Lord to take his life. Why? Now, I understand that God is in charge of all life. He gives man free will. God's in charge. But I believe he did that because he's like, my life belongs to you, Lord. My life is in your hands. It always was. Please, take my life. I'll read it again. 
It said here, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Okay. But this is Christ. Sometimes you can tell, I'm, I'm not trying to be 100% on this, but you can kind of tell, I don't believe someone who's truly saved and born again, and that's me, that's truly born again, will commit suicide. Why? You can go through the hardest times ever, but what's the difference between us going through hard times, us going through, us being saved, born again, body of Christ, Christians, real Christians, according to the scriptures? What's the difference between us going through depression and us going through hard times? Two things. A, we're not alone. Getting a little ahead of myself. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And our life belongs to Jesus Christ. Our life is in His hands. There's no better place to be. The Bible talks about no man can take him out of my Father's hand and no man can take him out of my hand. I and my Father are one. But we're in God's hands. Our life belongs to Him. Someone who's truly saved and born again, my life belongs to God. I fail Him. There's times I get rebellious, and the Bible talks about how He chases us as a father would a son. That's love, when He chastens us to get us back on the right path. But you have people out there that you look at them and go, why do you act like your, your actions? Because remember, words and actions need to line up. And it's the actions that matter more than the words. Okay, these words are very important, but these words won't do any good if you're not hiding them in your heart and living them. Okay, your actions are what matter, and your words and your actions need to line up, and their actions say, my life is my own. I can do what I want when I want. And I'm dealing with a lot of people, family, uh, lost family members that have a profession of faith. Uh, people around me that have a profession of faith, but they live as if their life is their own. They do what they want, when they want. They're the final authority. They decide what's right and wrong. Someone who's truly saved and born again, my life belongs to you, Lord. That's why we don't commit suicide. Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, we don't commit suicide. Our lives belong to God. Now, like I said, someone can bring up... Uh, a very rare time, or someone who's newly saved, and, you know, maybe that, maybe, maybe. But you have someone who's been living for the Lord, studying the Word of God. They've been living for the Lord for several years. It only takes a few years getting into the Word of God, hiding it in your heart, and living it, seeing the changed life, trying to do what's right. You're going through struggles. You're button heads with the world. You're button heads with your flesh. You're button heads with family members that have a profession of faith, or that maybe they, just, they don't want Jesus Christ. And it's hardship... But God is with you, and you understand that my life belongs to God. Anybody out there that's contemplating suicide, remember that, that has a profession of faith, remember that. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. The Bible says, ye are God's. You belong to God. You belong to God. Feed the church of God with his purchase with his own blood. You're not your own. Remember that. Okay. Verse 5, I just want to point that out. We, we that are saved by Jesus Christ, we belong to God. And we need to trust God. Verse 5, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water in his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. God took care of him. Verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? What, what doest thou here? Why aren't you out there doing the work of the Lord? Why aren't you out there witnessing to the Jewish people? What doest thou, Philip? Why are you, hi why are you in hiding? Why aren't you out there, you know, putting Bible studies out every once in a while, getting out there, gospel tracting? What are you doing? Right. Let's keep reading. Verse 10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I 
Stop right there, but the sword. Are we seeing that today? Are we seeing brethren turn from the word of God? This is the equivalent of today. I'm just of today of saying, hey, look at the body of Christ, turning on one another, stabbing each other in the back, bearing false witness, gossiping, backbiting and whispering, okay, fighting. But mainly turning their backs, you see brethren falling away, turning their backs on the Word of God so they can have the world. Turning their backs on the Word of God so their life in this world will be easier. Compromise. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You start compromising and you start not, your light for Jesus Christ starts fading and it's not shining anymore when you start blending in with the world. But you see that going on here. And what does Elijah say? And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. That's why he feared for his life. Because in his mind, in his head, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left standing. Lord, I'm the only one left standing. You hear, I've never said this, but you hear people on there say, I'm the only one preaching truth. I'm the only one preaching truth. I'm the only Bible-believing, God-fearing uh, channel on YouTube. And you hear people say they are. Then This is his mindset. I, 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 even I only am left. Everybody's forsaken you, Lord. I'm the only one left. You need me. I had to run. I couldn't die because you need me. But you know what? I'd rather you take my life because I belong to you, Lord, because I just can't handle this. Please take my life. You have men like that today? If they get so puffed up with pride and ego, well. But the men in ministry to the side, the average brethren that looks and goes, I see how bad things are getting in the body of Christ, and it's like, Lord, I only am I only left? So I go into hiding like like Elijah does. I'm the only one left. Nobody I've been hurt, I've been burned, I've been trying to preach truth, and at every turn it just seems like I'm getting burned by brethren at every turn, professing brethren, but some that are saved. And I'm just Lord, just it seems hopeless. Lord, take my life. Lord, can we go home now? Can we have the catching away now? I own I I even I only am left. How many of you guys feel like that? Brothers says Christ. We're so spread out throughout the world, and we sit there and we go, is there anybody else? You might be married to a saved sister in Christ, brother in Christ, so you know there's at least two of you, but are we the only ones left? Do you ever feel like that? Are we the only ones left that are standing? Not the only ones saved. Please understand, I'm not saying the only ones. He's not saying he's the only Jew. He just said there's Jews out there, but they for, they, your children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. I'm not saying I'm the only one saved. I believe I'm the only one saved. No. Standing. There's a falling away before the catching away of the body of Christ, and we're seeing it today. And it's, getting, it's supposed to get worse and worse and worse until God says enough is enough, come up hither. And God's the one that says enough is enough, not me. Not Elijah. <laughs> you know, we're going through the story about Elijah, but I'm not supposed to go into hiding saying enough's enough. God will say when enough is enough. Okay? Verse 11, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. Make sure I didn't overdo it. Okay. Upon the mountain before the Lord. And, the, and he beheld the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind went the mountains and break it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. People think that you, you have to have great, you know, have to have this man puts on a show and has all this power, you know. Uh, but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind on an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. Another way to read this, brothers, is Christ is saying, "Are you getting distracted by the world? This is all the world: earthquakes, fire, mountain." You know, the wind, it's the world. Are you getting distracted by the world? Some of you are. Some of you start and get on, uh, on here with the news and the debating and, and people who, who there's some brethren, that, there was a brother in Christ that he could have done great for the Lord, but he decided to give up, you know, preaching the word and 
count, calling out Bible perversions and he decided to do a Christian so-called news ministry, which there's no such thing. And now he's distracted by the world and he helps distract you by the world. What happens when you put the world to the side? There's nothing, like I said, there's nothing wrong with looking and seeing, okay, this is going on, that's going on. There's nothing wrong with spending a little time saying, hey, Lord, what's going on in the world? But a lot of people are getting distracted by it. Really getting distracted by it. What happens when you put that stuff to the side? And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of, in of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know why a lot of people are having a hard uh, Brethren, why a lot of brethren, I need to be specific, why a lot of brethren, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, why they're having a hard time hearing the Lord? They're being distracted by this, the flesh, not the heart, sorry, but the flesh. They're being distracted by the world. That's why. King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. He said it in the Psalms. The number one reason God doesn't hear prayer and doesn't answer prayer is because you're holding iniquity in your heart. The other thing is you're getting distracted by the world. Worldliness. Which we see here. He goes through the whole the world things and when Elijah finally says, okay, and focuses on that small, still whisper. World to the side. I'm going to focus on that whisper. He walks out of the cave where that whisper is. He's focusing on the whisper. What doest thou here, Elijah? Verse 14, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord of God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. Today the equivalent of me falling down before the Lord, saying, The brethren, they don't want the truth. And the, 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 the very few that do want the truth, it just seems like there's just fewer and fewer to the point where it just feels like nobody wants the truth. And they're compromising and they're getting it into the world and worldliness. And they're not doing things your way, they're doing things their way or they're doing things the world's way. They're compromising. And I only and I only am left. Right? Here it is. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. And if I go, Lord, there's nobody left standing. If, you, for, if you're a preacher, if I go, who's going to preach the Word of God? You need me, Lord. You need me. If I go, you need me. You get those, pre those preachers that are pretty prideful and get puffed up. This ministry is so important. Okay, The Word of God is important. The, ulti the, uh, the ministry that Paul, that we're all part of Paul's ministry... Okay, that ministry as a whole is important, but you get people that get so puffed up and so prideful, thinking, "Well, I have my ministry, and my ministry is so important. I alone am left, and, and if anything happens to me, God, end of the world. End of the world. You need me." Let's see what God's response is to Elijah. Verse fifteen. Like I said, I'm, I'm talking about it from a man in ministry because I'm trying to be in ministry. I'm, just, I'm not full-time ministry. For the men that want to be in ministry, and I'm also saying it for the average brother and sister in Christ out there, when you just have that feeling that I'm working hard, but it's, sometimes it feels futile. It's never futile. It's never worthless. You're, God sees you. Okay. You're going to continue living for the Lord no matter what. Even if you're the only... If you feel, Let's say it, it's not true. Because we're going to read this. But even if you were the only one, you're still to keep going. You're still to keep fighting the good fight. You're still staying God's word. You're still staying in prayer. You're still to live it. You're still to be a light to this dark world, to the people around you. Even when you feel like I'm the only one left, you need to keep going. Right. Verse 15. Let's look at the Lord's response to Elijah. I alone, I alone and left. You know? Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. He gives him a command to go do something. 
make sure I'm not missing the, the main part that I want to hear. Verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shophet, Shaphat, of Abimelech, shall be thou anointed to be prophet in thy room. In other words, you're not alone. But let's keep reading. And it came to pass that him that escaped the sword of Hazel shall Juha slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet have I left me, here it is, Yet have I left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You alone are left? Well, here's Elijah. Elisha. I'm sorry, Elisha. Do you think you're the only one left? I left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. Brothers Christ. I know I'm not the only one, but sometimes I feel like it. Okay. Uh, sometimes I'm starting to believe that, you know, the, I'm getting... Like, it's like I said, Brother Christ, it's hard. Forgive me. Sometimes it's hard, Brother Jesus Christ. Okay. Depression in, the life, in a life living for Jesus Christ, being a servant of the Lord, also notice that he, we talked about, ask the Lord to take his life. Our life belongs to him. But living a life of Christ is not easy in these last days. The temptation, how wicked this world is. Brethren falling away and you're trying so hard to, to bring them back without them grabbing you and pulling you away with them. How many of you understand that struggle? You're trying to help brethren and you're trying to bring them, you know, build them back up. When you correct somebody in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, it's to build them back up, to get them back into a standing position with you so you can be together in fellowship and we serve the Lord together. But there's that struggle that there's sometimes where you don't bring them up, they bring you down. You don't understand that. You're trying to bring them up to you, but they end up bringing you down to them. But they're down here, you're up here. You're trying to bring them up here, if I can say it right. But they end up bringing you down here. They get you to compromise. They get you to do not do what is right, pleasing God. They get you to turn on this book in certain areas of your life. Okay. We're not the only ones, brother says Christ. We're not the only ones. It's if we're in the last days. I, I I believe that with all my heart. Not but not just because we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, like Paul was. Paul was looking for the day of Christ every day with the life that he was living. Trying to serve the Lord. i got to preach the gospel here. i got to preach the gospel here. i got to do this. We could go home any day now. I believe that he believed that. And you have brethren that have turned their back on it. Why? Because the world got in the way. The flesh gets in the way. The world gets in the way. Now it wasn't guaranteed that he was going to come back in a week or in a month or in Paul's lifetime. It wasn't, that's not a guarantee. But Paul lived his life and he preached that we're to look for it. Okay. We're to look for it. Okay. Uh, here it is, 1 Corinthians 6.19. Remember when we talked about Elijah telling God that, uh, please take my life. Why? 1 Corinthians 6.19 we read, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, is it not your own? For ye are bought with a price. There's the address, 1 Corinthians 6.19. I'm not just saying it, say it, because I understand sometimes we don't know addresses and we try to quote from the Bible as best we can, but sometimes when you're doing a study, you can write them out. You should write them out. But for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And committing suicide doesn't glorify God. It's not pleasing God, it's pleasing yourself. Okay? People who, play, yeah, people who play God and take their own lives do not believe that their life belongs to Christ. It's just that simple. Okay? People say, well, I know someone who had a profession of faith that committed suicide. What are you saying? We'll find out when we get to heaven. Ultimately, we'll find out when we get to heaven. That's my number one answer. My number two answer is, is uh, I'm trying to warn the brethren that are still alive and haven't committed suicide. You don't do that. No matter how tough it gets, no matter how depressed you get, no matter how fallen you get, we're in the falling away. Turn back to God. 
He'll take. He'll help you in a heartbeat. He'll pick you back up. When we brothers in, in Christ correct the body of Christ, men in ministry are correcting the body of Christ on things, we do it because we want to see you built back up. Back to serving God fully and completely. Okay. But our lives are not our own. Elijah, Lord take my life. My life's not my own. Okay. In 1 Kings 19.10, we read that, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Throw down thine altars, slaying thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. Today, slaying the prophets with the sword, remember the sword is the word of God, but people can be using the, the words of the world. That sword is worthless compared to this sword. Okay? But people are trying to slay men, good men in ministry with words. Backbiting and whispering. Mocking. Name calling. Bearing false witness. Trying to make that person look bad. Stay away from that man, he'll mess you up. And they try to make that man look bad. It's happened to me. Try to make me look as bad as possible so nobody will listen to anything I have to say. They're doing that. Right? And brethren are falling for it. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay. Without getting too much off on a tangent, I remember Brother Brian, he called out uh, Steve Anderson. He called out uh, Robert Breaker. And I went to their channel and I actually had a discussion in the comment section with those people and said, is it true? Do you really be don't believe repentance is part of salvation? The plan of salvation? Do you don't even have to pray? You actually believe that the body of Christ goes through and, and faces God's wrath for Steve Anderson because he's a, a post-tribber? Do you really? I went to them and, and said, "Do you really believe this?" Now, don't get me wrong. Brian Demlinger, in the past, he'd actually show the video and, and break it down and word and use the word of God to show that person was wrong. So yes, Steve Anderson in his video said he believed it, but I wanted to go to the man and find out. Not that I, I'm not that I'm calling Brian Demlinger a liar, but I went to the man to find out. This is years and years ago. Uh, Robert Breaker, the same thing about the gospel. Is it true you don't believe repentance is part of the plan of salvation? Do you even taking prayer out of the plan of salvation? You don't repent, you don't pray, you just have head knowledge, and you're saved. That's Robert Breaker. I went to them and found out. Right? Now, like I said, if a brother in Christ shows the video and cuts down the video and shows where the person is lying or where the person just an error, not purposely lying, but he's an error, because sometimes you have brethren that teach that wrong things. I've been caught wrong and had to apologize and repent. Um, I say caught because I just called out. Caught means that you, you were purposely trying to do it. It kind of makes it sound like that. No, there's some of us that we are wrong sometimes. Okay. And we have good brothers in Christ and meekness instructing those that will take the time to sit down with us and we talk about the Word of God and show where the Word of God is right and where I'm wrong. Okay. But I go and talk to them and it's like, I've been blackballed, brothers in Christ. The King James Bible has been blackballed, <laughs> blacklisted. Okay, And they're using their world swords, their words, to try to destroy people's faith in this book. Okay. Uh, the fellowship of the brethren, trying to use their words to destroy the fellowship of the brethren. But when it says here that they slain the prophets with the sword, there are men of God that are doing their best to serve God, and they're going to through depression. Some of them are giving up. Some are compromising. Some are getting distracted by the world and the flesh. And it says here, and I only, and I even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I'm the only one left. And we've talked about it when we read through it. I'm the only one left. Okay. Just going through my notes here. I'm the only one left. Make sure I didn't leave anything out. Okay. He says, notice he is saying it is as if everyone has. He's the only one left. Everyone has done this. Everyone. Not some or a certain group that branched off, but everyone. He's saying, everyone's turned against you, Lord. I'm the only one still serving you. I'm the only one still standing. Haven't compromised. 
We all struggle with the flesh. I'm still struggling with sin, Lord. I do still fail you, Lord, when it comes to sin. But when it comes to absolute truth, I'm standing. Am I the only one still standing? You, you act like I'm the only one standing, Lord. Everyone else has fallen. Also notice when this is happening, he is not preaching truth nor correcting the people. He is on the run. Well, like I said, we go, some brethren will go into hiding. I know some good brethren that had some good Bible studies on YouTube, and they disappeared. They took down their, they didn't take down the channel, but they took down all their videos. They had some really good videos. What's going on? They're on the run. Okay. In the last few months, have I been on the run? Just hiding. Getting so tired of all the fighting. I mean, everyone always says it. We are we are to fight, brothers and Christ, and we're to continue fighting. Remember what God did. He gave him food because the journey's too hard for him. God will give us respite. He'll let us rest. He'll help take care of us and help get, build up our energy so we can get back out in the fight. These last three months, could God God didn't tell me to hide. That was all on me. But could God been, you know, taking care of me, trying to build me back up? Get back out in the fight. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to living for Jesus Christ, are you on the run? Are you in hiding? This world is pretty bad today, brothers and sisters. It is so bad out there. But are you running? Are you hiding? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm talking spiritually with how you're living your life. There might come a time where we have to go into hiding. There might be physically, like what we're reading here with Elijah, because, you know, they're seeking his life. There might come a time where true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, right before the catching away, will be hunted down, like they were in the past. Could we go back to it being that hard again? Uh, maybe. Maybe. But my point here that I'm mainly hitting you up, brothers and sisters Christ, is your walk with the Lord. Are you starting to hide? Remember, God, another point to bring up, God came to him and talked to him. He went off to hide somewhere, Elijah. And God came to him and said, What doest thou, Elijah? What doest thou here, Elijah? He came to him. And then Elijah's like, Oh, oh yeah, Lord. Are you like that? Are you starting to hide? Is your prayer life starting to dwindle? Is your Bible reading life, are you starting your day with prayer and the Word of God? Are you ending your day with the prayer and with the Word of God? Or have you gone a few days without reading or praying? Are you starting to feel like you're on the run? You're starting to hide. In 1 Kings 19, 18, chapter 19, verse 18, we read, Yet I have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which are bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Brothers Christ, you're not alone. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one left standing, and you are not the only one left standing. Beware of the feeling that you are the only one left standing. Beware of ministries that try to push that they are the only true ministries left. I've never once said that this ministry is so, I'm part of Paul's ministry, but my work in Paul's ministry is so important that if I go, it's the end of the world, it's the end of the world, had that attitude. Okay, I know they don't actually say those words, but they act like their ministry is just so important that if anything happened to it, end of the world. Beware of that. Beware of that feeling. I mean, you're going to have it from time to time, but get into reading the Word of God, and God will put you in the right place in the Bible to encourage you to say, hey, you know what? You're not the only one. And even if you were, you're not. But even if you were, continue. Keep fighting. Keep fighting the good fight. We're going to get into this with Paul. All right. 1 Corinthians 1, 11. I've stopped turning because we've got to get through this. I'm still on the first page out of five pages. We might not get through all of this. Or I might break it in half. I'm sorry. I just, I love Bible preaching. I love Bible teaching. If you love the Word of God, you will take time. Okay? You will take time to go through the studies. 30 minutes here. Break it up into 30 minute parts and whatnot. Give me just a second. Just one second. Looks like the battery's going dead. Shouldn't be, it's plugged in. Oh, thank you, Lord. I 
And now we're back to full power. <laughs> I don't know, I'll edit that out or I might not. It was just a quick thing. But back to the study, please. Not distractions. <laughs> Apologize for that. Back to the study. Okay. But we're not the only ones. 1 Corinthians 1.11. We're going to move, move, move. 1 Corinthians 1.11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. There are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. I am of Christ is the right answer. One of the things that's really getting me down is no matter how much preaching I try to do, or how much I'm trying to reach the brethren to say, we need to stop being followers of man if that man is not Jesus Christ. Paul said, be followers of me as I am of Christ. Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. He had a ministry that God gave him. Paul can say that. You're, not spo you're supposed to follow me, because another part in the Bible, Paul says, follow us. He didn't say follow me. He said, follow us. He's talking about men in ministry. He says, follow us as you have us for an example. I'm supposed to set the example for you to follow. We're supposed to set the example for each other. We're supposed to be a light, an example to the lost world that they need to get saved. And, you know, the changed life. When God takes you in, He gives you a new life. But when it comes to the ministry itself, the work of the Lord, we're supposed to be followers of Paul as Paul is of Christ. We're supposed to be part of Paul's ministry. I know people like to say, you're a Paulinian, you're a Paulinian. But ultimately, we're supposed to be following Christ. This is the foundation. Paul was saying, this is the foundation I'm preaching. I understand the Bible wasn't all the way writ, but the Word of God is what he was preaching. The Word of God is the foundation. Christ is the foundation. There's no other foundation that a man can lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the foundation. I'm following Him, and I'm setting an example as the apostle to the Gentiles. You all need to be following Jesus Christ. So you see here today, one of the things that gets me down, gets me very depressed, is I'm looking around, I'm seeing everybody's, I'm of this person, I'm of that person, I'm of this person. We're all supposed to be of Christ. We're all one in Paul. We're all one in Brian Denlinger. We're all one in uh, Peter Ruckman. We're all one in Philip Newton. We're all one in Sam Gipp. We're all one in 33rd book. No. We're all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the foundation. The Word of God. The King James Bible. Amen. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? You know what happens when you start... Uh, when you're a ministry of one, or you're a ministry that really lifts up one man. You might have more than one, but it really lifts up one man. People start getting into worshiping that one man. And the next thing you know, when they disagree on something, what does that do? That causes division. Because instead of sticking to the Bible, there's things I disagree with all those men I mentioned. There's things I agree with them on. There's things I disagree with them on. But because this is my final authority... It doesn't have to cause hardcore division. This is the final authority. I just point him to this saying, hey, I believe you're wrong. And I give him to the Lord after trying to correct him. I give him to the Lord and let the Lord deal with him. And I get back to the book. Because this is absolute truth. Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? What causes... The number one thing I believe causes um, contentions division in the body of Christ is when people stop being followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have a lot of sheep and the number one shepherd is supposed to be Jesus Christ. Now we are, I know the Bible talks about being shepherds as far as being pastors and preachers, you know, bishops and deacons and whatnot, but ultimately that sheep, you're, those were to point you to the ultimate shepherd, Jesus Christ. This is the foundation and you need to be following Christ, Jesus Christ. But what causes most attention? When people stop being followers of our Lord Jesus Christ and they start following the men in the Babel buildings. Men on YouTube. I didn't say, there's two types of following. What I mean by following is that man's the authority. That's what I mean by following. You can follow somebody like as far as the term following, like I'm just listening to what he has to say. I'm keeping up with what he's putting out. You know, like that idea of following. But when I say following, I'm talking about that man's the final authority. 
If what he says goes against this, we go with what that man says. That's what I mean by following. They're not being followers of Jesus Christ because what the world says, or Jesus Christ says, you go with what Jesus Christ says. This is the final authority. But a lot of people today, and another thing that's just so depressing and so frustrating, is a lot of Bible-believing Christians say, no, no, this is the final authority, but they're still going after that man. You can prove to them, to their face, here's the Word of God, they're wrong, they're going against the Word of God, and they'll still follow that man while claiming to be Bible believers. No, you're of Paul, you're of Apollos, you're of Cephas, but you're not following Christ. This is the final authority. 1 Corinthians 4.16 we read, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. This is Paul. Okay. Yes, Paul did say it. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. The gospel was given to Paul to give to the body of Christ. The gospel I preach is the gospel that God gave to Paul. Jesus Christ gave to Paul. That's the gospel I preach. Not the gospel of men. Taking repentance out of the plan of salvation. Taking prayer out of salvation. Head knowledge. Taking the changed life out as evidence of salvation. Taking that away. No. Okay. But Paul could say this, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Be followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so you have us for an example. Us for an example. We are to set the example. Absolutely. But this is still the final authority. And when this man here is not lining up with this, you go with this. And I'm not saying it just to say it, I mean it. There's times where brethren have went with this and they've corrected me and I was wrong. There's times where I still believe that this is right and they're wrong. <laughs> okay. But this is still the final authority. That's why I always have that attitude. If you, if you believe I'm wrong somewhere, let's, let's sit down and have a Bible discussion and find out where the Bible's right and I am wrong. I did that with, I want to call his name out, I did that with Brian Denlier with our disagreement on Christmas. I emailed him and said, let's get together, let's sit down, let's do a Bible study together, and let's find out where the Bible's right and I'm wrong. I never said he was. I said, and find out where I'm wrong. But this book is always right. Did he want to do that? Absolutely not. The old Brian, he would have. He would have sat down and talked with me. The, I mean the old Brian. The Brian that was saved, loved the Word of God, loved the brethren, and was in a standing position, not as distracted by the world and worldliness, he would have sat down and talked with me. He would have. But the Brian today? And it's not just Brian. I'm not just calling him out, singling him out. There's times where I've realized I've failed. There's people who come to me with false doctrine. I know they're false, but if I can sit down with them for the, for the first time, if it's the fifth time, I'm done with you. I've tried, I've tried, I'm done with you. I understand that attitude that, that's justified. But if it's the first time I'm talking to this person and I can try to plant some seeds and, and preach truth to them, I'll sit down and talk with them. I will. Okay. Maybe that person is truly saved, but they got messed up really quick. They got deceived really quick. Satan loves to pounce on babes in Christ. I'm just being honest. He loves to pounce on people that are newly saved and try to get them messed up from day one. He really does. Could that person just be messed up from day one? And he needs to be pointed to the truth. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together with me, and mark them which you... We already read that one, sorry. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And ye become followers of us and of our Lord... Notice how he's meaning the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, backing up a little bit. It says, be followers of me, even as also as I am of Christ. He brings Jesus into it. When you're following me, uh, let you know that I'm following Christ. So we're, we're supposed to be following Christ. He's just setting the example. Brethren, be followers together with me and mark them and watch them. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And ye become followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost and the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14. For ye, brethren, become followers of the church, churches of God, which is in Judea, are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Talking about persecution from family members, from people around you. The Gentiles were being persecuted by Gentiles when they got saved. 
as the Jews would be persecuted by the Jews as they got saved. Okay, that persecution's there. But become followers of the churches of God in Christ Jesus. It always comes back to Jesus Christ. Are you following Jesus Christ or have you fallen into the trap of being a follower of a man? Are you of Paul? Are you of Paulus? Are you of some Bible building man? I remember Sam Gipp, I'll call him out. I remember him saying, I don't I have my pastor that I have to follow, and I'm under his head co like head covering, but you don't know if he used the word head covering, but under his authority. I don't have to listen to other pastors. He actually said that. Now I'm not saying he doesn't listen to them. I'm talking about we're talking about authority here. In other words, those other pastors don't tell him what to do, and if they tell him what to do, it goes against what his pastor says, he's going to listen to his pastor. No, this is the final authority, Sam Gibb. That's another thing that's so frustrating. So, some great men of God that work so hard to defend this book, and yet they can't seem to follow it to save their life. This is the final authority. And if the pastor that you're following, that you're under his authority, goes against this, you're to follow this. Jesus Christ and his perfect written word, that's the final authority. When Paul saw that they were not following Jesus Christ, but following, uh, falling into men worship and men pleasers, he called them out for it. He even threw himself in there. And I try to throw myself in there. You're not supposed to be a follower of Philip Newton. You're supposed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a follower of Paul as Paul is of Jesus Christ. But it always comes back to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6, 6. Not with eye service or men as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Not the head. The heart. Once again, 13 inches. There's people that have the knowledge. And they do things based off the knowledge. But Paul saw right through them. Not with eye service, as men pleasers. You have those people out there, they're men pleasers. Especially the ones that are followers of that man. They're men pleasers. You have men in battle buildings, there'll be men pleasers trying to please their crowd to keep them following them. And then you have the crowd that are men pleasers trying to please that one guy. Not, not please God. What is it the Bible's talking about with the, some of the Pharisees? They love the praise of men over the praise of God for the men in ministry. And for the ones that are in ministry and following those men in ministry, uh, you're, you're praising Him over praising God. You want, you want to please Him over pleasing God. And I've seen people do it. There's times when uh, Brother in Christ was right, and people were rushing to defend the man, and they didn't take time to think, and they weren't doing a good job. They actually made the man look worse. Because they were just rushing to please that man and not please God. Because if they had pleased God, they would have taken time to study the Word of God and, did a, and they, they would have defended the Word of God. Not the man. The man is right on with the Bible, so you defend the Bible. People used to get on to me saying, You're defending Brian Denlinger. You're a Brian Denlinger. Right? No, I was defending the Word of God. He just happened to line up with the Word of God. And the moment I defended the Word of God where he didn't line up with the Word of God... I got attacked by, by people who were supposed to be, you know, brethren. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6.6, 6, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. When you're being a servant to your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're being a servant to Jesus Christ. It always comes back to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Colossians 3.22, servants obey all in all things your master according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. If I had to sum it up into two things, the two things that are destroying the body of Christ today, you want to know what those two things are? The number one thing is fear of the Lord. I don't see much fear of the Lord in the body of Christ. We have the knowledge, we know we're supposed to fear the Lord, but you're not fearing Him down here. We talk about it. Our words say we're, we fear the Lord, but our actions say we don't fear the Lord. Right? 
Brother says, when we struggle with the flesh, our conscience, along with the Holy Spirit in us, is nagging us saying, don't do that. You're going to have to answer for it someday. Don't do that. That's because there's still fear there. But when you, there's some people I've come across where the Bible talks about how you can quench the Holy Spirit. You can talk, your, you can numb your conscience. I, that's not the word the Bible uses, please forgive me. It never says kill. We did a study on this way back when. It never says kill. You can't kill your conscience, but you can silence it, or you can get it down to where it's such a whisper that you've taught yourself to ignore it. Okay. And you keep and you do it. Where's the fear of God? The number one reason why the body of Christ is failing is because the fear of God is not there hardly or it's very weak. It's not as strong as it should be. The other thing is true love in the Bible. If a man love me, he'll keep my words. If he love me, keep my commandments. There's no greater love than this than a man laid down his life for his friends. You're to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Love is an action, not a feeling. It's not something you say. I've had brethren tell me, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. But when the true test comes up of disagreement, hard times, or, you know, butting heads with your favorite guy, your, the man that you worship we just talked about, you know, holding a man up above Jesus Christ, where's the love? I've had brethren turn on me, and they have nothing but hate and bitterness towards me. One minute, I love you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. Next minute, I hate you. They're trying to destroy you. They're bad-mouthing you behind your back. They're gossiping about you behind your back. They're talking about you behind your back. They're lying about you behind your back. Oh, yeah. It's the heart. Love. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and we're taught what true love is in the Bible. What it really means to love Jesus Christ you take His Word, you hide it in your heart, and you live it. That's loving Jesus Christ. Not just saying, I love you. It's not just a feeling where you get to raise your hand in these Bible buildings to satanic fleshly music. Ah, ah, that's just so much love. I just got so much love for the Lord. That's not love for the Lord. Love is taking His Word, hiding it in your heart, and living it. And the body of Christ today is starting to fail in that area. Big time. I failed from time to time in certain areas of my life. Fearing God and what true love is. Loving Jesus Christ and loving the brethren. What it really means. If you love your brothers in Christ and you see that they're on the wrong path, you go to them in love and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves to see them get built back up. You want to see them put back up in a standing position. You're there with the helping hand to try to help them. You don't just turn on them like that. Even if they're wrong, you don't just turn on them with such hate and bitterness. But we see that today. Just nothing but war and fighting going on. There's nothing but war and fighting going on. It's the heart that matters. But up here, a lot of people, it's all up here and not down here at all. Some brethren, it, it, was, it was up here, you get saved, born again, it comes down here, and you're starting to forget it. You're starting to go into hiding. Galatians 1.10 For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men... I should not be the servant of Christ. Today I've come across a lot of men pleasers trying to please the, the men that they follow and that person ain't Jesus Christ. It ain't Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. It's not Jesus Christ. It's that man standing behind the pulpit. It's that man in YouTube, behind the camera on YouTube. Brother says, Christ, I don't want you to be followers of me. I want you to be followers of Paul as he is of Christ and I'm pointing you to the word of God. This is what I want you to follow. This is what I want you hiding in your heart. Okay. I might be getting ahead of myself, but like I said, we might get to a point where we're not on YouTube anymore. Um, right now, my advice is to download good Bible studies. Buy, um, buy good videos. I bought some of Peter Ruckman's videos. His Chalk Talks, they're okay. All right. Please understand what I say when I say this, because I'm just, I'm, I'm talking. Please, I'm, I'm talking with the brothers and Christ. Not lost people. His chalk talks are not good Bible studies. And you have men that you can tell the difference between someone who actually loves the Word or loves a good show. His chalk talks are okay. 
But when you have people that stand up and say, he's the greatest preacher ever, and they're based off his chalk talks, you're dealing with someone who doesn't really know the Word of God or has a true love for the Word of God. His best things that I've ever seen Peter Ruckman do when it comes to videos is his question and answer videos. Uh, his videos where he does a talk, like a preaching, where he puts the chalk down and actually opens the Bible. He does some amazing, I've learned some amazing things from his question and answers. Why? Because he's got the Bible there and he's flipping it open. Okay, put your hand here, hold your hand here, and that man does know the Bible. Don't get me wrong. He's wrong in some areas. I, I disagree with him. He knows the Bible, but his chalk talks are him putting on a show. When he puts the chalk down and actually picks up the Bible and says, turn here, turn there. There was one where he talked about, is the Bible scientific? I love that study because he's saying, turn here. He's going through all the Bible, the Old Testament, going through it. So he's showing how scientific the Bible is. But he's saying, turn here, turn there, turn here. That's good Bible study. That's good Bible preaching. Grabbing a chalk and telling lots of stories that might seem great. Because like I said, they're, they're, they're okay. That's not a Bible study. That's just, you know, preaching. Te I call it testimony preaching. He's test telling all these stories, testimonies, and he throws a few verses in. That's not a Bible study. That's just preaching testimony. Okay. But good Bible studies. Collect these things. Have them on you. But the number one thing you need to have on you is this right here, the King James Bible. If you're using a Bible perversion, get rid of it. And get this, a King James Bible. If you need a King James Bible, contact me through the uh, email, and I'll get you a King James Bible. Okay? If we get to talking and you're really, truly saved and born again, I'd probably still do it anyway, but if you want one of the really nice Bibles and I can afford it, and we get to talk for a while, I'll get you a really nice Bible. Uh, if you need a, because uh, they have $20 Bibles that are the cheap, what I call cheaply made, but those, they're, they're still good. They're still good. But if you want a lifelong Bible, like this is the Bible you're going to have for the rest of your life and be able to give it to your son or your grandson, I'll get you a nice Bible. Okay? This is the number one thing you need. You need to be born again. You need to get saved. Born again. You need to have the Holy Spirit. Part of being born again. Through the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. He, when He saves you, He gives you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit directs you to His perfect written word. Once you've got that, you're good to go. You can fight. You can live for Jesus Christ in this life. Okay. These last days, you're going to... Uh, oh, uh, hard drives. You can start downloading a lot of good Bible preaching. Bible studies. Uh, good videos of men of God preaching the word of God. And have it at your home. And you can no longer do the internet. You know... Can all, you finally get smart to the Babel building system and come out of the Babel building systems. Um, you can still serve God and watch Bible studies. Because okay? some people say, well, what do I do? Well, you got the Word of God and you got the Holy Spirit. That's all you need. But God has been nice enough to give us a, more. Okay? Romans 12.1 I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, real quick, because I might lift it out, left it out. The whole point of me bringing it up being, I fell into that trap of trying to, you know, please a man and hold a man up above the Word of God, okay? And I see people doing it, and it's causing depression. And a lot of brethren are just, they don't, they're starting to go into hiding because of all this fighting that's going on between people's, whoever they're, I'm of so-and-so, I'm of so-and-so. Is that why you're hiding? You don't comment, you don't talk, you don't fellowship, you don't want to rock the boat, you just don't say anything. You see, brethren, that I've, I've had disagreements with one minute with a brother in Christ that it seemed to be going great. Uh, the Bible talks about a friend that's closer than a brother. I had a brother in Christ up in Canada, a friend that's closer than a brother. And the moment I disagreed with him, he started following a guy, and he started worshiping that man. And the moment I disagreed with that man, he turned on me like that. Just like that. A friend that's closer than a brother, I talk to him once or twice a week, turned on me just like that. It gets to you, Brother Jesus Christ. It gets me down. It, it's depressing. I'm, I, I, I'm, you start getting lonely. And then you start making bad decisions based off loneliness. We've talked about that in other studies. But Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not conform. Loneliness will get you to conform. Uh, bullying, people bullying you, uh, guilt tripping you, bribing you, tries to get you. Those are three things. I've seen men in ministry that, that are paying ministries where they take donations. They use those three tactics to get you to donate. But the world uses those three tactics to get people to buy their stuff. Politicians use those three tactics to get you to compromise and, and vote for them. Okay? Bullying, guilt tripping, and bribing. Those three things. Mm -hmm. Don't conform. Don't conform to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. And men in ministry, if, I know I'm nobody, I've been blacklisted, I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. To Jesus Christ, I'm somebody, praise God. But to the body of Christ as a whole, the professing Bible-believing body of Christ as a whole, I'm a nobody. But if you happen to come across this and you want to be in ministry, or you, you have a small ministry, a uh, small part in the ministry, or you might have a big part in the ministry, okay? you're not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And men are in, that I've seen in ministry that started out really good, and great, they've gotten very prideful, very proud, okay, arrogant. I use the word arrogant, but the, body, the Bible's proud. They're, they get very proud. But it says, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think. You need this ministry. If I don't get enough donations, I'm going to quit the ministry and get a secular job. Okay? When I put out videos... And people don't give me money. It's like I'm casting pearls before swine, or that which is holy among the dogs. All right? This ministry is just so important that you know, without this ministry, everything would fall apart. Type attitude. You know. You know I'm important. You know. And especially those who self-proclaim themselves to be bishops and deacons and elders. Remember, you get ordained as a bishop deacon or elders. You have ordained elders. The body of Christ lays their hands on you and the other men in ministry will lay their hands on you and say, okay, we're, we're praying for you and ordaining you. You can be, you're, you're now a preacher. Uh, I'm sorry, a bishop, a deacon, an ordained elder. There was, some, there was a brother in Christ that tried to declare himself an ordained elder. To think more highly of himself than he ought to think. I'm not an ordained elder, I'm not a bishop, and I'm not a deacon, brother and Christ. And there's no such thing as though anybody that has a full-time online ministry that tries to claim to be one of those three, they're liars and deceivers. Okay. A whole other discussion. But not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Beware of ministries that boast that they are the only ministry left and that that ministry is just so important and you can't live without that ministry. Are you saved? Are you born again? Do you have a King James Bible? That's what you need. Okay? That's what you need. God will take care of the rest. God will lead you to men in faith. God will help lead you to men, help teach you the truth. Okay, don't get me wrong, God uses men to preach truth, absolutely. But God will take care of the rest. Stay in prayer, stay in reading the Word of God. God led me to the truth. He led me to good men of God to pre preach the truth. Now I learned a lot. Okay. But these people are just boasting. Be careful. You're dealing with someone who starts to get very prideful. And I might be getting ahead of myself, but I've noticed with these men in ministry that start bu and by, in the battle building systems that stand by, they start having the attitude, I did this and I did that. Have you noticed that? Maybe you haven't. I have. They'll have the attitude, I did this and I did that. And it's like, what happened to the Lord used me? The Lord did this. The Lord did that. What happened to God getting the, getting the glory? They take all the glory for themselves. They might not know they're doing it. They might just get prideful and puffed up with themselves. Maybe they don't know they're doing it. And you've got to bring it to their attention. Hey, where's God getting the glory? Where's God getting the glory? 
Um, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Am I doing that? Start going into hiding and say, Lord, am I becoming so puffed up? Am I getting prideful? Uh, I, I hate to say it like this. Am I getting to the point where I think my poop don't stink? Some of those preachers on YouTube and some of the preachers in the Babel building system, yeah, they have that attitude. My poop don't stink. Everybody's poop stinks. Okay. Are they preaching the truth? If I'm wrong, am I, am, I, am I getting so prideful, thinking more highly of myself, they're above accountability. A lot of these people are getting very prideful on YouTube, other video platforms, behind the battle building system. I mean the pulpit, behind the pulpit in the battle building system. They get so puffed up and prideful, they start getting to the point where they're above accountability. That the people that follow them get fearful of correcting them. I was fearful. Why? Because the man would blow up. How would he take the correction? Would he take it with a grain of salt? Would he take it, you know, I'm doing it in meekness and out of love? Would he receive it with love? Even if I'm wrong and he's still right, because there's times I went to correct somebody and I was wrong and they were right. Okay. But is they going to receive it? A lot of people are scared to correct these people but in the Babel building system. The man that they're following on YouTube. They, they fear to hold them accountable. Why? Because they fear them more than they fear God, which we just talked about. The other thing with men in ministry, be, fear, be careful of the ones that are uh, the flatterer. I call it the flatterer. Be careful. Beware the flatterer. Okay? You're the only Bible-believing ministry left. I've noticed people that puff people up, that feed that pride. They see, I'll, I'll use his name, Brian Denlinger again. You see in him a little pride. He used to always struggle with a little bit of pride. But when he believed in the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the day of Christ is at hand, he would always keep it in check. Okay? But once he turned his back on it, that pride started growing and the enemy saw it. And the enemy gets onto the channel and starts throwing all these uh, you know, compliments and flatteries and some of the things. You're the only Bible-believing preacher left on YouTube. You're the greatest preacher there ever was. And, and then, Beware of the flatterer. I've heard people say the same thing about Peter Ruckman. He's the greatest preacher that ever lived. There's not going to be any more preachers like him. What about Paul? Well, you have like the others. You're being a worshiper of a man. There are a lot of great preachers out there. Peter Ruckman's not the greatest preacher that ever lived. Well, he's the greatest preacher in our time. He's not the greatest preacher in our time. He's got some big mistakes that he made. Okay. I'm not the greatest preacher before someone tries to point it at me. Oh, are you saying you're the I'm not the greatest preacher of all time. We're all doing our best to serve the Lord and preach the Word of God. Those that get in ministry, beware the flatterers. When Satan sees something in you, he's going to start poking at it, trying to get it to grow bad things in you. Okay? Uh, temptations. You have your temptations. Uh, pride. The love of money. When he sees you start falling into these traps... God can get you out. Brethren can correct you through the Word of God and help, help build you back up through the Word of God, through encouragement. But Satan likes to poke at those things to try to get them to grow. And I believe this one man that like, I'm talking about, he just got so prideful. His pride just went through the roof. And he, he's got a lot of flatterers. When people hit me up, I give God the glory. I try to. I might have failed a few times, but I try to always give God the glory. Why? Because it reminds me, when I give God the glory, that I'm not the one doing this, it's God. God's blessing this. If someone got saved off the gospel that I, that I, the, that I preached through the Word of God, praise God. If someone learned something through the preaching, praise God. It's God. You give God the glory. Okay. Be careful. Be careful. Not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, whether you're in ministry or not in ministry. Be careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's where grace for the brethren come in. If you expect all the brethren to be perfect, I've fallen into that trap. If you expect all the brethren to be perfect, you're going to be disappointed. I only fellowship with those that are perfect. You'll always be alone. Now, don't compromise. 
Them that sin re rebuke before all, that others may fear. When someone won't give up that sin or someone's struggling with sin, that's where the grace comes in. I'm sorry, the grace comes in when someone's struggling with sin. Yeah, you're right, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't have done that, you're right. They're struggling. But by all means, when someone tries to justify sin, or they get mad at you, who are you to judge me, when you call out their sin, then the sin rebuke before all. That's what I believe that's talking about. When someone holds on to that sin and won't give it up, then you rebuke them before all that others may fear. Okay? But when we fail the Lord from time to time, uh, and we repent and get our hearts right with them forsake, you know, that's where the grace comes in. When you can, you can tell the difference between someone who's struggling with sin and justifying sin.